Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to our Standing Watch program. What is the number of the beast? We have all heard about it, those who are a little bit knowledgeable about the Bible. That number is 666. What are we to make out of that one, though, however? There's a lot of superstition, a lot of false concepts floating around on the Internet, in books. And so, just this week, I found this article by AFP, dated November 17, saying this. Senior clerics in Greece have told the state in no uncertain terms that vigilance is required to prevent the Antichrist from making a manifestation on new ID cards to be issued next year. The authorities must ensure that the cards contain no mention of the number 666, which in Greek Orthodox tradition is associated with the Antichrist, the Church of Greece said in a statement. The article goes on to say, frequently criticized as backward and superstitious by liberal circles, Orthodox custodians strongly adhere to tradition surrounding the number 666, which appears in the biblical book of Revelation, believed to have been written by the Apostle John in the first century AD. Also known as the figure of the beast, the number has led ultra-Orthodox clerics to oppose the use of barcodes on goods, as well as electronic checks carried out under the border-free Schengen area of which Greece is a member. But is it going to be that easy to identify the beast by just looking at a microchip, or a barcode, or an ID card? Well, this concept is in fact very superstitious, because the Bible tells us something altogether different when it comes to the number of the beast. First of all, we've got to understand who and what the beast is. In Revelation chapter 13, first the beast is introduced. An animal with seven heads, ten horns. And it's identified as the Roman Empire, having swallowed up the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, and the Greco-Macedonian Empire. But it also says in Revelation 13 that that Roman Empire would have a deadly wound. One of its heads would have a deadly wound, but that wound would be healed. In other words, Rome would fall, the Roman Empire would fall, but it would be revived. It would be resurrected. And the fact that it has ten horns shows us it would be revived or resurrected ten times. And nine of those ten revivals have already occurred. First, we had barbarian tribes, German tribes. And then we had Justinian, bringing about the imperial restoration, as it is called in history, when he combined and unified again East Rome and West Rome. And then, of course, we had Charlemagne, Charles the Great, all records seem to indicate he was a German, and he was crowned as emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And then later you had Otto the Great, who was crowned as emperor of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. And then you had Charles V, who was also crowned as emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, and he was from Habsburg tribe. In other words, he was an Austrian. And then, of course, later you had a revival under Napoleon. Now, Napoleon was being looked upon as a French, but he was actually an Italian. And then we had another revival under Hitler and Mussolini. Mussolini actually concluded that he had revived the Roman Empire, designating himself as the emperor of the Roman Empire. And Hitler, of course, also had great admiration for Charlemagne and for the Roman style. His Hitler greeting was, of course, adopted from the greeting of the Roman Caesars. By the way, Napoleon believed that he was the incarnation of Charlemagne. And so we have one more revival to be watching. And of course, this is happening right now in Europe as we speak. You see, all these revivals took place in Europe. And so we can understand that the beast is going to be a power which is going to manifest itself in Europe, not in America, not in the Middle East. And so we find that then later, after we are being told about the revival of the different empires, the focus shifts in the book of Revelation in chapter 13 and in other chapters to the final representative of that revival. And he also is called the beast. And he is identified as a man, not a woman, a man. And it says that he will have a number. It will be a number of the man. And that number will be 666. And it says that those who have wisdom shall count. The New King James Bible says calculate, but the authorized version says count the number. In other words, 
it should count the numerical value of the letters in the Greek language because John wrote in Greek, the book of Revelation is written in Greek, and those numerical values need to be counted or added to reach the number 666. Now many commentaries have told us that when you go back in history, that numerical value applies to Latinos. Let me read to you from the Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary saying this. Irenaeus, in the second century, disciple of Polycarp, John's disciple, explains this number as contained in the Greek letters of Latinos, L being 30, A1, T 300, E 5, I 10, N 50, O 70, S 200. But when we look at the scriptures in the book of Revelation, we also find that the number is associated with the last representative, apparently, of that beast power, also called the beast. And commentaries understand that too. The so Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary goes on to say, the last antichrist, or beast, may have a close connection with Rome, and so the name may apply to him. But you see, not only that, we are still supposed to count the numerical value of his name or of his title when it becomes known. And his name or his title will amount to 666 in the Greek language. That's what we need to look for. It says those who have wisdom, they will be able to identify the beast, that last leader of the revived Roman Empire, amongst other things, based on the number of his name. Now you might say, well, if it's that easy, then everybody would be able to figure that one out once the beast, this last leader, will manifest himself on the world scene. Not so. We read that both the beast and the false prophet, a religious leader, will deceive the nations. They will deceive the nations so much that they actually are going to be worshipped by the peoples. And it says only those who are specifically called for that purpose will be able to designate and understand who that beast is and what the number of his name will mean. It is incumbent to us to watch, to watch world events, not to look at the wrong places, not to look at wrong solutions, not thinking that we can look at a microchip or an ID card and thereby designate who the beast is going to be. I dare to say that at this point, that particular leader has not identified himself yet on the world scene, but I do believe he does live. He is walking amongst us. And in a few years from now, we will see who that leader is going to be. It is going to be a leader in Europe, in all likelihood of German or Austrian descent. That is one of the criteria we should watch for. I recently gave a sermon with the title, Who is a Beast? And I spoke over an hour about other characteristics from the Bible identifying this last leader. If you want to listen to the sermon, go to our website, eternalgod.org, eternalgod, one word, dot org, and go to our audio file, and you can listen to the audio version. I, also, you can watch the videotaped sermon as well. I think it would be very interesting for you to do that because many people are confused. Many people do not realize what to watch for, and they will be surprised. They will be perhaps so deceived that they won't recognize the beast when he appears. Thanks very much for watching. This is Norbert Link for the Standing Watch program.